going to start the session because we have until 10 past four to hear four presentations on local energy trading systems. I'm, I'm Jan Webb, Edinburgh University. I'll be chairing the session. I will aim to move the speakers on after 10 minutes with any points of clarification, very brief. Uh, and then we'll have time, I hope, for the four speakers to join us on the panel at the end. We're going to start with David Much from Swan Barton, who are specialists, as I understand, in energy storage consultancy, particularly uh, with, a, with a particular interest in local energy system security. Uh, and you're going to talk about the Iona trial, I gather. So, David, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jan. Um, I'm, my name is actually Simon LeBlond. Um, I'm a colleague of David, so I'm presenting this work uh, today, David's work and some other colleagues uh, on, on their behalf. Um, is there any chance of getting the bottom of my slide there? It seems to be uh, obscured by the uh, menu. Oh, help has arrived. <laughs> there you go. Excellent, thank you. So uh, I work at a company called Swan Barton. We're a small business based near Malmesbury in the West Country, and we call ourselves uh, energy storage specialists. So we have uh, a number of different business activities. We organise a big um, flow battery conference uh, in the summer. Uh, we do ad hoc consultancy, um, looking at storage business models and marrying that up with the uh, technical side of things. And another thing we do is Innovate UK uh, funded R&D projects looking at <coughs> Uh, researching um, demand side flexibility and storage uh, control mechanisms and within that um, Innovate UK work we've also been looking quite closely at um, automated peer-to-peer -peer, uh, local energy trading. Um, I'm going to talk about one of those projects, so the Emblem project, which is establishing mutually beneficial local electricity markets. So when we talk about peer-to-peer -peer trading, what are the differences between uh, the traditional energy market well, you could argue that the traditional energy market, um, based on the supplier hub model, is really uh, a monopoly because although you can change suppliers, and this is what Ofgen is very keen on, it's actually very difficult to change suppliers. It takes several weeks, um, and this leads to a low uh, amount of uh, switching between customers. But in true peer-to-peer -peer market, um, you get to change your choice of supplier very quickly on short-term uh, time scales and the, um, the the supplier can choose who they sell to as well. So the traditional energy market, uh, prices are fixed. This leads to high prices for consumers and low prices for producers. But in a peer-to-peer -peer market, because uh, prices can be negotiated between uh, producers and consumers, um, you create a price that uh, is more favourable for both, cutting out the supplier and different parts of the pricing stack and um, you also have a, a price signal which varies with time and a lot, um, uh, on a lot more granular timescale. So the Emblem project was on the beautiful Scottish island of Iona, um, and we were delivering the trading platform, our real-time trading uh, software, and our partners Scene Connect from Edinburgh were supplying uh, metering hardware and doing the participant engagement piece. Uh, including an app that they developed. So the trial uh, was three months um, last year. Um, in fact, we're still collecting data, but those were the official dates. We had 26 participants in our local electricity markets, 19 of which were consumers and five were uh, PV prosumers who had a, um, cons a generation as well as consumption. We also simulated one large wind turbine to see what that did to the uh, market dynamics. We had um, a battery, which was actually a UPS 
system, which was import only, um, but we were able to simulate various other kinds of battery as well to see how that affected the market. So what made Emblem different? Well, um, previous LEM trials um, sort of worked to this half-hour time step um, that the energy market um, uh, beats to, um, whereas with our trading software, it works on a one-minute time step. So it's much more granular, and that gives an opportunity for much more granular, localised uh, matching of energy. Um, and the prices were negotiated between um, the um, traders rather than any centralised price setting through a supplier. So here are some stats from the trial. Um, we had a lot of trades over that three-month period because of the very granular uh, market time step. Um, and we assumed that um, various parts of the pricing stack, um, because the trading of energy was local, that the um, network costs um, could be largely neglected. So that um, gives a higher price for um, suppliers for selling their energy and a lower price for uh, consumers buying that energy directly from um, people producing it. Um, so this led to um, renewable local renewable revenue uplifts and a price saving, uh, a cost saving for um, consumers. Um, we all know that the regulation leaves a lot to be desired uh, surrounding realising this uh, utopian dream of local energy trading, but um, given that the regulation could possibly be changed, the, um, the cost benefit of doing this is, is very favourable. Um, it creates a long-term uh, incentive for investment in renewables because of that, increasing that revenue. Um, but if you can actually follow that price signal with automation or behaviour change, then um, it, it um, creates a short-term price signal for uh, things like storage to actually benefit from um, the arbitrage within the LEM. So we looked at the market dynamics in quite a lot of detail. Um, it's important to realise because this is all automated, we could simulate various um, case studies uh, within our uh, software environment using the um, uh, measurements that we'd taken uh, from the real participants within the LEM. So we uh, coined this term called energy abundance, which is basically supply less demand. And we found that the uh, price, the average price within the LEM, um, as you'd expect, varies inversely with the energy abundance. So more, more supply available and the price goes down. Um, but not only that, it varies with the sign of the derivative of the abundance too. Um, so we looked in quite a lot of detail how um, uh, our LEM behaved in terms of market dynamics. Then we um, added different types of storage to see how the storage could benefit um, and be sort of symbiotic with, with the LEM. We simulated a large front of meter battery. Um, and as you'd expect, it flattens out the local energy abundance by um, charging uh, from the available energy um, when there's a surplus and discharging when there's a shortage. Um, and we had a real UPS within the LEM, and that was import only because that's what uh, UPSs do. Um, so there are gaps in the second time series because it could only uh, buy at certain times. Um, we also simulated um, domestic behind the meter batteries and we found that there was actually a very um, compelling case for combining batteries with the LEM and the, um, the benefits of the LEM um, sort of were synergistic with the <laughs> dreaded word synergy uh, synergistic with the um, battery um, so it improves the economics of the battery because the battery was able to play in the LEM and and the, the LEM benefit improved as well. Um, so those are the batteries we are simulating. We were actually using another piece of Swanbarton Intellectual Property, uh, the multi-storage manager. It's just an algorithm that exists in this box in this case, but can also exist in the cloud. And that basically uh, does the arbitrage over a given time horizon. <laughs> 
So that was Emblem. Um, we've got a number of live Innovate UK projects uh, ongoing and are due to kick off later this year. We're doing things with Devon County Council, um, a, a project called Lemdex, slightly bigger assets, um, which is actually easier than the, um, than the domestic customer uh, LEM because the loads are more predictable. Um, and um, we're doing things in the third world in Rwanda using our real-time trading uh, platform um, to look at uh, microgrids, uh, whether the, the, you're completely off-grid or the um, grid supply is, is flaky. Are consumers willing to, um, to get paid to have an interruption to their grid connection? How could you use the battery as a kind of... Um, uh, local uh, services uh, operator to actually preserve the grid stability. Lots of interesting uh, technical economic problems to get into there. Um, we're also doing some commercial uh, delivery for uh, UASA, um, who make uh, batteries over in uh, Rassau in Wales. They've got their uh, factory there, and we're putting a battery on site, and our multi-storage manager is, is managing this uh, dual chemistry battery. Um, so we're very busy at the moment, but we're always interested in opportunities to work with partners, academic and uh, commercial. Um, just a little bit about our other intellectual property. I've been talking about our real-time trading platform, um, which does the LEM. And um, we've also got um, uh, an algorithm that does um, aggregation of um, domestic scale assets to offer ancillary services to the grid, things like reserve, store, that sort of thing. Um, and our multi-storage manager um, uh, manages um, batteries um, uh, against a uh, varying uh, price um, profile, and it's been proven at this uh, site in Wales. So um, that's all from me. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Any points of clarification very briefly? Uh, well, one there and one down here, the first two I saw. Oh, thanks. Um, very briefly. So you said the um, revenues were up 60% and bills were down 60% for the uh, Sorry, I can't hear you very well. Sorry. On the slide, the claim was uh, bills down 60%. Yeah, yeah. That's, is it necessary basically for you to exclude the use of system charges because the algorithm is providing that service? Yeah, so um, we've said that we can um, neglect some of that, right? Um, not, not, probably not all of it. And in our new project, we're doing a big a piece on regulation and what we can likely get the rules changed to. Um, but in the results that you saw there, um, the highest price that um, consumers were willing to buy locally was set at the price that they would buy from the grid, and the lowest price that consumers were willing to sell locally was the, uh, price, the, the price that they could achieve from selling to the grid. So that, that gave you the kind of trading window, and those were, that generated the sort of revenue up that you can see on this slide. Is there more material here? Have you got a report or something? Yeah, um, they're all in the UK funded projects, so the deliverables are publicly available to the department. Is it very brief? Yeah, it's very brief. You had 1.7 million trades. What was the transaction cost per trade? <laughs> uh, I didn't work on the code base myself. Um, do you mean in terms of... Um, the kind of putting a little slice on there, um, you know, kind of the, the platform vendor. Yeah. Um, we haven't modelled that, but we'd assume there'd be a tiny, uh, a tiny amount you know, compared to the rest of the pricing stack would be negligible. It doesn't cost very much; it's just information. So. Okay, thank you. So let, let's move on then, please, to the next presenter. In the interest of having some discussion time together at the end. So, pleased to introduce Michael Fell. David is also here, and the Chipworth, both of the UCL Energy Institute. And I think Mike is going to talk about using this particular 
realist synthesis approach to literature review on local energy trading systems? Yeah, that's right. So thanks very much, um, yeah, Mike Fell from UCL. Uh, thanks very much for staying. Uh, I always sort of think it's a case of survival of the fittest um, by this stage, uh, so well done for that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what this concept of a realist review is, um, and then about how uh, we, so that's David and uh, my other colleagues, um, Chris and Carol, who are also here, how we're applying this in a couple of projects that I'm involved in. So this is uh, one project which is directly related to um, to peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading, which is happening as part of the uh, Centre for Research into Energy Demand Solutions. And then uh, another one on the Energy Rev project, which um, we had the workshop on this morning. Some of you might have attended that. So, I mean, I think generally in this whole space, all of us are kind of interested in what works when it comes to local energy systems. We want to understand um, how to get these uh, sort of good outcomes, I guess, in the end. But I think it's also been widely recognized throughout all the discussions we've had so far that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, we want to know um, not only what works, but for whom, under what circumstances, um, in what respects, and how do we get these outcomes? We want to actually understand how they're coming about. Um, so we're not only interested in the outcomes, we're interested in what we normally refer to as the mechanisms by which they come about, and whether those mechanisms might operate in some contexts and not others, which can allow you to better understand what you know, what sort of uh, what sort of solutions and approaches might be appropriate in some areas and, and not in others. So it really helps with that transferability. So briefly, the process um, involved in a rapid realist review um, normally starts out with developing uh, a theory of change. So that is a set of hypotheses um, based on your existing uh, knowledge, reading assumptions, and so on, about the outcomes you're interested in um, and how they come about and how that might depend on context. But then importantly, we go out and look at the available evidence to see, is there anything that can substantiate these hypotheses? Is there reason to believe that our expectations in these respects are true? Um, or do we have to go back and revise those hypotheses so that um, you know, links which we'd hypothesized, causal links that we'd hypothesized might be the case aren't actually substantiated or, or, or are different to what had been believed? Um, and that process can, is continually iterating um, as new lines of inquiry and new evidence are becoming available. And on, that, uh, on the basis of that, obviously, we produce, we produce outputs. And importantly, throughout this process, um, it's, it's really important to keep all stakeholders uh, involved, appraised of um, you know, what the theory of change is, is representing, um, but also to get their input, help us identify evidence and so on. Um, so that's the basic process um, which we're following. So the first project which, which we're um, bringing that approach to um, is a project of this uh, CREDS uh, center. Um, broadly looking at distributed ledgers or blockchain um, as a disruptor of energy retail markets. And one of the main um, use cases for blockchain uh, at the moment and is anticipated to be in peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy trading. And in the context of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, I'm particularly interested in what that might mean, what the impacts might be on uh, people, households, communities, society at large. And we're conducting this realist evidence review um, and in line with good practice for any form of systematic review, um, the protocols be made available um, at that link there. So if you're feeling yourself lacking any interesting bedtime reading, um, I highly recommend it. But actually, uh, that, that's, that's also where um, a lot of the, the, this initial kind of map of, of the theory of change and expectations is set out. So if you're interested at any point in uh, going into any of this in more detail, then that's quite a good document to to check out. So I just want to kind of give almost a sort of illustration of the process we're kind of going through. So where we're at at the moment is I'm in the process of collecting evidence, but I want to talk a little bit about the theory of change and what some of the things, what some of the uh, questions we might be looking at are. So I want to just uh, focus for illustrative purposes on the question of bill savings, which is one of the important benefits, and we kind of heard about how that might be possible in the previous 
talk, uh, you know, and I, I think th this is the mechanism by which that was occurring there. The access, you know, get, you will only buy energy potentially, or so that's assumption, people might choose to buy energy locally because it's made available to them cheaper than they could get it from the general grid. And you might expect to get bill savings in that way. It might give us the opportunity, might give prosumers the opportunity to offer discounts or even donations to certain groups of people such as friends um, or a local school, for example. Um, it gives that possibility. Um, there could be, you, you could hypothesize some uh, connection between people thinking, here is a valuable local resource uh, energy which um, I now have access to. Um, I might want to use less energy and reduce my energy demand. Um, there are a couple of uh, a couple of possible factors. So obviously a large part of bills are not just the energy cost, but the network costs and any tax um, taxes and levies which are also included within that. Depending on how the scheme is uh, arranged, if, if the peer-to-peer -peer trades are happening in a sort of behind-the-meter context, we might anticipate that some of those costs would be avoided by participants, resulting in bill savings for them. Um, and also, there's a potential for uh, you know, middle actors of various kinds, such as suppliers, to be um, cut out in these operations, especially if those, these are uh, uh, um, underpinned by uh, distributed ledger technologies like blockchain, which I kind of won't go into. So these are a whole bunch of mechanisms by which we might hypothesize bill savings could come about. But like I said, we're also interested in the contextual factors. So might we affect the outcomes associated with these mechanisms? Might, might certain of these mechanisms work or not, depending on factors like the location, where we are, like what is the potential for solar generation? Socioeconomic, and I could add to that, cultural factors. Um, whether we're talking about urban or, urban or rural locations, whether people are on the gas grid, uh, whether communities are on the gas grid or not, whether there are local network constraints at the moment. And then um, characteristics of the peer-to-peer -peer trading scheme as well. Um, you know, are we talking about hyper-local ones consisting of just a few houses, like we just heard about now, or sort of city scale or even national scale schemes? Um, are people constrained to participate only in one local monopoly scheme, or are they picking and choosing between many different schemes overlapping? Um, does what is the scheme's uh, aim, stated aims? I mean, is it aiming to have uh, various kinds of social and community benefits, or is it, uh, or is it a straight, straightforward profit-making sort of uh, company? So there are all these factors which might determine whether or not these sort of mechaniz mechanisms come into play. And, I mean, I've been framing this discussion so far in terms of the potential benefit, but we've got to kind of remember as well that there could be disbenefits. So uh, might, might non-participate, there's this sort of within-without divide. People who can't participate, might they miss out on these savings? I talked about avoiding network costs and levies. Uh, you know, and, I mean, we've heard these, discussions, these issues come up as well. Uh, is that going to transfer a cost burden to other non-participants? You know, what affects who can participate? Um, I mean, and uh, I've just used bill savings as a quite an obvious sort of illustrator there, but there are a whole bunch of other issues to do with um, what we might think of as sort of traditional computer, consumer rights and how you deal with complaints and redress in a situation where you might not have any one key sort of supplier-like entity, but rather those responsibilities are distributed. Um, separate to bill savings, the questions of income and who stands to actually make positive gains or not um, from, from these situations. and. You, you know, who is in a position to be owning generating assets or smart appliances, for example? And wider social considerations such as, you know, are, are there potential for you know, training and employment um, opportunities in, in connected with these schemes? Um, might they, as some people think, support uh, community uh, attachments and social trust, or could they actually lead to more antagonism? Um, in some cases, and health benefits and so on. And I just want to briefly, because in a lot of the work I'm doing so far, like, we, one minute, okay, we're seeing evidence emerging in this area, but there's not a great deal from the peer-to-peer -peer energy trading area at the moment. So I'm drawing quite heavily on wide literature around the sharing economy. So if you, for example, think about Airbnb um, as an example, um, this is just an example of a study which showed that the people who tend to participate in these programs tend to be highly educated and well-paid. Um, they use the platform as a way to augment their income. Um, but some of the more labor-connected um, uh, sharing economy offerings like TaskRabbit, you know, they have other implications around, um, around employment. And I'm just going to say that 
you know, some of these clearly don't apply as much in the energy area. We're not maybe thinking about displacement, displacement of, uh, sort of blue collar workers in this area, but there might be issues around who owns what assets. So you can sort of selectively take from, from existing studies in related areas to try and inform this work. And just to finish, I just wanted to also briefly mention that this project, um, uh, in comparatively early stages, um, I'm working on um, the work package of uh, the Energy Revolution Research Consortium, um, which is concerned with interdisciplinary knowledge synthesis. So it's our responsibility to take the findings and learnings from the other work packages, the broader program, and the existing evidence that everyone else here is, is producing and has been produced over many years, and try and bring that together in a sort of a coherent way to provide uh, you know, a clear picture for, for a range of stakeholders. Um, and that's something which I'm just about to start, the sort of theory of change process, building that at the moment, very keen to engage with a range of stakeholders around that. So if you're interested in any more of those um, projects, uh, I'm putting up the links there to my open science framework pages. Um, the top one for creds, the bottom one for energy rev. That's where any of the kind of publicly available documentation is going to go, including protocols, theory of changes, and so on. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, to check those out and contact me, and I'll be reaching out to various people as part of that. Um, so that's everything only except to say, uh, to acknowledge um, David is involved in this work, and also Carol and uh, Chris as well. Um, and uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Any brief points of clarification? Uh, considering, that, considering that you've, you've uh, mentioned blockchain, did you think of uh, how that might fit into a, a uh, currency for energy and energy systems? Yeah, it's interesting. It's something which I can't really touch specifically. And so I tend to be looking at blockchain as, as an enabler of the trading system as opposed to a way in which you might pay for the, for the energy, but I think that's sort of within scope and I will be kind of considering that. Any other brief points? No. Okay, thank you. So thanks very much, Mike. We'll move on thirdly to Alexandra Schneiders, who is a colleague, uh, again, of... Uh, both Mike and David's at University College London Energy Institute and is going to talk about regulating peer-to-peer -peer trading. So again, a rather distinctive strand of the work and is getting the slides. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, figure this out, but uh, I don't know. Assistance is on its way. Is this it? No. Yours is it? This one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, hi everyone, I'm um, Alexander Schneiders and I'm a colleague of Mike and uh, David. Um, so, I'm going to present to you now on uh, regulating peer to peer energy trading and what can the UK learn from other countries, um, how they are regulating it. And uh, just to give you a bit of background, so um, I am, uh, my research is on peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, but mostly from a law and policy perspective. And what I'm going to present to you now is based on research I carried out uh, as part of the Petrus Internet of Energy Things project, as well as Energy Ref project. So, just to give you a bit of context, I mean, you've already heard a lot about peer-to-peer -peer and the good things about it from the previous presenters, but... Uh, so we're, most of us are aware that the energy system is decentralizing and um, people are then able to produce energy easier because it's, they have access to cheap technology such as solar panels and then they can feed this energy back into the grid. However, this feeding of energy into the grid is causing um, management problems on the grid such as uh, the ability to balance supply and demand. And peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, um, which is so someone has excess energy from the solar panels and they sell it to, for example, a neighbor that needs the energy, uh, could be a solution to this uh, grid management issue. And then you have uh, balancing a supply demand of, uh, at the local level. And right now, peer-to-peer um, -peer is at a pilot and pre-competitive stage. So you have pilots all across the world, uh, some of them in the UK as well. 
And uh, policymakers are now thinking about how they will re regulate this uh, activity also because technologies such as blockchain are being used in these pilots and they can carry a lot of risks for, uh, for example, the consumers that are, that are using the technology. And two approaches have been um, taken across the world. So the first approach is legislation. And this is where countries have already drafted legislation that allows for P2P energy trading to take place. And there are two examples here, France and Spain. They recently um, really, um, enforced this legislation and it's actually quite strict. So, for example, uh, with France, you have to be connected to the same low voltage substation, same with uh, the Spanish law, and you have to be also part of one legal entity. So, for example, an energy cooperative. I think this is in the interest of protecting the people that are participating in this trading and, and their rights as consumers. Then you have the European Union um, that has also recognized the rights to P2P energy trading in its Renewable Energy Directive, which it recently revised, and it came in, into force uh, last December 2018. And the directive also states very clearly that consumers that are trading retain their rights uh, as consumers, as long as it's not their primary professional or commercial activity. So this is a very useful clarification because it ensures that consumers remain protected even though they're trading and making money out of it. And the question is, will the UK transpose this? Because it actually doesn't have to transpose it in light of uh, Brexit. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but So actually, just to note, the French and the Spanish laws have both been amended and we ran a, a workshop with uh, French counterparts last year uh, at the UCL Energy Institute and we heard from, from startups that were running these peer-to-peer -peer pilots that they found the French law to be very limiting and stifling and they were not able to um, make profits out of this and, and, to, and to not rely on government subsidies. So they found the law to be actually too strict and to, stif to be stifling innovation. And they have now, the French law has now been um, made a bit more flexible to, to make the perimeter a bit wider within which you can trade energy, and the Spanish law as well. So it seems that policymakers are now realizing that the laws were a bit too strict. And this brings me to the pros and cons. So the good thing about uh, drafting legislation, and I think something that the UK can learn from, is the fact that you protect, first of all, think of protecting consumers. So as the EU did in its directive, where it said that consumers retain their consumer rights when they trade energy, this is very important because you have to make that clear so that people then, there's more um, initiative to trade energy by consumers. However, the cons are that, as I said, Spain and France drafted legislation uh, which was quite strict and um, yeah, businesses didn't seem to like and so it's not innovation friendly to already start drafting a law and a very strict law with very strict conditions. So the second approach is the regulatory sandbox and this is the approach taken by the UK actually. Uh, and this involves a process where um, you allow uh, new innovations to be rolled out within a controlled environment with a limited amount of consumers and you test these new ideas such as peer-to-peer -peer using blockchain or other technologies which are actually illegal. So in the UK, peer-to-peer -peer is illegal right now. Uh, it's only taking place within the sandbox of Ofgem, the energy regulator. And the idea is then that the pilots get exemptions from rules that they think are obstacles or laws and they test their trial, so with this rule on the side, they don't apply the rule anymore. And at the end of the trial, they see, um, Ofgem will see then if they have to change the rule based on the trial results. So this, um, this, is a, this is not only the UK one, but there are sandboxes across Europe. And the UK one, just to mention, it's run by Ofgem, but um, it's also Elexon taking part, the balancing and settlement uh, body. And this, you can only derogate from legislation that is enforced by Ofgem and Alexon. So it's actually quite limited. And if you look at, for example, peer-to-peer -peer trading using blockchain, you have issues such as data privacy, uh, contract law, and there's no guarantee that these rules can be derogated from because it's quite a limited scope of what you can derogate from in this UK sandbox. And it's also only two-year trials, which is questionable whether that's enough time to really change a law afterwards so that the pilot can keep on running and provide certainty to the consumers participating in the pilot. Then you have other sandboxes. In the Netherlands, you have 
uh, a sandbox that allows for 10 year trials, which is a very long time. And you can derogate from the main uh, legislative framework around energy. Uh, so you have a lot of leeway there and you can test a lot of things. However, it's only open to energy cooperatives and owners associations. And I think that this is so that they can, again, to protect the people participating. And that's why they have so much freedom to do whatever they want in these pilots. Then the French one, which um, is foreseen, is, hasn't yet started. And this would be four-year trials and open to all parties and also um, allowed to um, derogate from the main legislation around energy. And there's the Belgian one, which has only one year, and this is run by the TSO. So I think that the sandbox approach is preferable to, to legislation because you get to know uh, a technology before you start to draft legislation. So the legislation is then more innovation friendly and it's more tailored to new technologies. So I think that the UK is doing well by running this sandbox. However, I think that, um, as I said, it's not open to all legislation and this is a problem because then you don't get a realistic view of how it would be when it's rolled out at a wider scale. And this is then problematic, problematic for uh, stakeholders participating, such as consumers, because their rights have to be protected. So I think that it should look at other countries, such as France and the Netherlands, where they allow for derogations from the main energy uh, law framework. And the UK should think of doing that as well, so apply to all the energy codes and all the laws. Um, and it's also the questionable time frame of two years. I think that 10 years, like Holland, is, is maybe too long, but maybe the four years, like in France, uh, that could be a good balance because then you have enough time to really test the technology and also have time to maybe ch think of changing the law uh, in time for the pilot to be rolled out at a wider scale at the end of it. And something I forgot to mention is that uh, in the UK, the sandbox is only open to licensed parties and partners of licensed parties. So you c it's not open technically to all the stakeholders here that would be interested in peer-to-peer, -peer, which is a shame. So um, to conclude, what can the UK learn from others? Well, I think that the legislative approach is not favorable because you end up stifling innovation with very strict conditions without getting to know a business model. So the sandbox approach is good. Um, however, the UK should think about maybe the EU example and follow the EU's lead, uh, where it's, it, it, could, it would enshrine consumers' um, rights, the fact that they can be still protected by consumer law if they choose to trade energy in the future. And However, e even though the sandbox process is, is preferable, it still leads to legislation and rules. And I think that legislation and rules are actually not the right form to really um, regulate peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized models. And we can take this, exam this examples of accommodation and transport, such as Uber and Airbnb. I mean, it's not really working out where the government says, you guys have to follow these rules. There's a breakdown of trust. And um, it's a bit like a, a, a mouse and cat game where one says, well, we'll do whatever we want. We can pay the fine anyway. And then the government says, well, they have to listen to us. So I think that uh, when it comes to the energy sector, well, inevitably, there will be a decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer model coming up that, um, that the government should already start thinking about other alternatives to laws, such as uh, standards or uh, principles, and then giving more power to the intermediaries. So, for example, energy communities uh, that can self-regulate according to principles set by the government. So, thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them. Thank you.
Uh, I was also going to ask, did they, on the French legislation amendment, did they change uh, kind of who, whether individuals could participate, could trade as individuals in more of it, or was that what they were No, so they, they kept this legal entity um, criteria, I think, because they're very scared of the rights of consumers and we protect it within one legal entity. But they uh, only changed the perimeter to make it wider. Thank you. So, grand finale, we have two presenters, uh, Ingrid Bennett and Andrew Tofts from Your Energy Sussex, which I understand is a collaboration among a number of councils, county, borough, district in Sussex, and talking about improving energy services. Thank you. Now, how do we do this? I presume you have to escape. No, no, no. Oops. Hang on. Hang on. Where's the mouse gone? Can't find it. Can you see it? No. 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 Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. There you are again. Sorry. <laughs> we love the technology. So you guys do energy and I'll do the PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so this is... Hi, so I'm Ingrid and this is Andrew. Um, we're working on the Business Clusters Integrated Sustainable Energy Packages Project, which is the BSEPS project. We love EU acronyms. It's a, I'll go into what that project is, that, but um, Andrew and I work in the West Sussex County Council Energy Team. We, like Oxford and Bristol, are working across a range of different projects, including solar for schools, solar farms, battery storage, district heat networks, and we're also a partner in the newly announced Smart Hubs project, which is the West, which is the Leo version in West Sussex. So the BSEPS project is an Interreg 2Cs funded project, and it's focused on increasing the uptake of sustainable energy in business parks. We aim to remove the existing barriers and to enable cooperation between businesses to exchange both electricity and heat. So we're quite interested in all of this peer-to-peer -peer trading. So our project is producing a BSEPS model, and the model is designed for business park managers and local authority planners to help assist with the potential deployment of renewable energy in their areas. The model looks at how heat and electricity work together. So one company's waste heat could be another's resource. It will remove the need to undertake high level area wide feasibility studies. So potentially saving between 20 and 40,000 pounds, just depending on what kind of high level study you're doing. So the BCEPS toolbox is both qualitative and quantitative input, so type of energy and energy demand and that kind of thing, and with a technology matrix as well. And so you can select which technologies to assess for each cluster. So when we're looking at the business parks, you're looking at different buildings within the business park and you can determine, but depending on which country you're in, because we're working across France, the Netherlands and... Belgium and the UK, uh, you can choose which legislative requirements you've got. So, for example, at Manor Royal, we exclude wind turbines from that technology matrix, whereas in Belgium, they can include wind turbines and a whole bunch of other technologies that we probably don't utilise here quite so well. So the model outputs the energy synergies between the different buildings and clusters within the, the business parks, and the entire toolbox, which is the orange box, it does look orange, um, includes business case templates which we've developed and engagement strategies that we've worked on for each of the project partners and what we've learned. So hopefully we can replicate using this tool across other business parks around the county and country, with any luck. So we've worked mostly with the Manor Royal Business Improvement District and we completed a high level study. 
um, which, as I said, the BCEPS model would remove the need for, and we had very limited engagement with businesses at the start. The study identified areas with high potential that showed financial promise, and they're the clusters that you can see up there, one, two, five. We're missing cluster four because we had no engagement from the businesses there, so we had no actual energy data to assess. So we then completed detailed feasibility studies of those four clusters, um, and it was mostly around solar, ground source heat pumps and CHP was what came out as being the most feasible options. We've also were doing a separate district heat network study, um, which was initially led by Crawley Borough Council, and recently we just um, was the sex with Crawley as well, we successfully applied for a little over £100,000 from Hindu to continue that uh, initial master planning study to now do a feasibility study. Part of that funding is dedicated to stakeholder engagement because in this area there is no local authority base load for a district heat network, so we need to do a lot of extra engagement with the businesses. I'll now hand over to Andrew. Right. Okay. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, yeah, um, I get the uh, I get the good job. You've made it through this far. So, um, I mean, we are of course trying to do things right at the ground level, which is in a bit of contrast, perhaps, to some of the earlier uh, presentations. And we have inevitably faced um, a whole lot of barriers and 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 identified various other obstacles. Um, I'll just concentrate on a couple of things and the main one is the one that Ingrid has already mentioned is, is, is engagement with the businesses. Uh, it's taken a long time. We've been going for, um, well not, not three years yet, but almost three years. Um, and it's only now that we've got a group of core businesses who are keen, who want to do something and really want to get on and do it. Um, we're hoping that um, that, will, that will really help us there. Also on Manor Royal, it's a big place. It's got um, 500 businesses on it, just south of Gatwick Airport, maybe 30,000 employees on, in the area. Um, and it's very complex in terms of uh, the, the tenure, the land holding. You get owner occupiers all the way through to absentee landlords working through um, agents um, and, and many of them. So uh, when you come to start thinking about putting uh, say PV on roofs and things like that, you have a whole number of different complicated conversations to have. So that's a bit of a barrier there, but it can be overcome, we're sure. Um, right, um, and I think that, uh, I think for ourselves in terms of risks, there's two main ones, again, I want to highlight there. One is that we don't get enough businesses to give us a critical mass to take this forward to, 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 to full implementation. And then the second one is actually because the project is being driven at the moment by ourselves with the European funding, um, if there is for any reason at, um, at West Sussex a change of um, motivation and support from within the council, we're all very constrained. We all have to focus on various priorities. Um, budgets do change. Um, then the danger is there's a risk that we won't be able to take this forward anymore. Um, oh, where are we? Page down. So, page, page down. Right, there we go. But of course, the businesses themselves and also the Manor Royal Business Improvement District, um, which is absolutely key to getting stuff done and holding people together and they've actually put it in put energy at the heart of their five-year business plan which has just been approved by the businesses on at manor royal um i mean apart from the savings that people can make directly on bills they do recognize that there are the businesses recognise that there are opportunities for new income streams through sale of power or grid services or whatever. Um, storage um, didn't feature too much in the feasibility studies, but we're very aware from other work that it's a, a very real possibility here. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, I mean, but what we've had to do, there's, I won't go through the list here of, of, of opportunities that we've got. Um, the opportunities, and I won't reiterate, but say that you know, changes in regulation to enable peer-to-peer -peer, um, trading over the existing network will be um, absolutely wonderful for our project. Um, but what we have to do with the businesses 
is not is to take them on a journey which de-risks the process of getting from where we are now to an integrated energy trading system where businesses are trading with each other. Um, and um, and, and uh, this, I think, I've sort of summarised this in saying that we've got three stages. It's install, cooperate, and then trade. At the moment, the businesses are at the install stage. They've got to now step up and make the decision either to spend their own money on putting in some renewable energy um, equipment um, or to allow other people to do that for them and therefore share, share the benefits. Um, uh, but even then, we could start setting up what uh, we could st set up uh, what we could call a, um, uh, a, a collective energy management company um, and a CMEC in, in this case. And that can bring benefits even now. If we get enough people working together, you can, you can, you, you can uh, get... Uh, you can get buying power in the market for installing stuff. Uh, we can bring installers in so people get... M and the whole thing about this is to make it easy for businesses because they're all really busy doing what they're doing and concentrating on their own business and making that work. So they don't have the headspace to do too much on the energy. And One then... Minute. Yeah, sorry, OK. We'll be there. <laughs> we'll be there. Ultimately, of course, um, where we want to be is a fully integrated system. As mentioned previously, peer-to-peer -peer is illegal at the moment here, but what we don't want to do is to do something like uh, go down the private, uh, the private wire route because we might be left with a big stranded asset. Um, I think ingrid has got a few conclusions on this. We'll flip over that one, shall we? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So we decided that we would not do conclusions, we would do critical reflections because our project is an ender jet. So, as we've already said, one of the hardest things that we've found is the engagement with businesses, and that engagement is absolutely essential. It's required a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings with businesses, phone calls, and getting them interested and engaged. And you really do need to have someone driving the process. So, while we're trying to make it so that this whole BCEPS process can be replicated across other business parks, we're still not quite sure how you can do that if you don't have someone like me and Andrew driving this as to go forward. So I guess a couple of the other things which are really essential, as we all know, local energy communities should be integrated into the government. We need to change the policies. We need to change the policies for peer-to-peer -peer trading. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the France and Netherlands from your perspective as well. Um, the Netherlands, I know that the Netherlands, our partners there have, in Breda, have made bids, their business improvement districts as well, and I'm pretty sure that they said that their business improvement districts have to do energy as well as be business improvement districts, which I thought was quite an interesting take, and they picked that up from participating in this project with us, and they started implementing those bids last year as a process from learns from us. Um, and Belgium have totally different rules for sales of business park properties and planning for business parks. So it's been quite interesting that, yeah, Belgium can't sell electricity over a property boundary, so they don't have the private wire network issue. That legislation is in the process probably of changing because of the new EU directive, which you also, which Alexandra also mentioned, the 2018 EU Renewable Energy Directive, and that has to allow trading of energy in areas. So it's been a really interesting project. We're still on the path and we'll probably be able to give you an update next year. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any points of clarification for Ingrid and Andrew just before we move to the full discussion? Um, we haven't looked at that in any great detail because we don't yet have the asset with which to to to, to, to create that. In fact, open to looking at it. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and and in fact, in some of the other projects, like uh, we've got, uh, I, I know that we are evaluating that for sure. And we have a, a solar farm as West Sussex with four megawatts of storage, and so we're very much involved in good services from that. Thank you. So can I invite the other speakers to join Andrew on the platform? We've got about 20 minutes for discussion. So four very nicely complementary presentations there on different aspects of local energy systems and local energy trading. Um, can we have questions from the audience? We'll take them three at a time. David. Um, can I ask everybody in the panel, and perhaps this shows as much my lack of knowledge, but it is this question of transactions, and it was mentioned by somebody here. Um, so if you look at the solutions that you're considering, if they do go through to actual transactions with money going from somebody to somebody else, um, what are your comments about well, who are going to be doing those transactions and this question of, you know, if you are going to be doing a lot of them, isn't there a significant transaction cost? Okay. Other questions? Um, I wanted to ask about the cold watching implementation in these markets uh, where I don't understand how, if you become a price maker in the local market, how it, can blockchain actually um, you make that available? And, and but if you don't have a central uh, central agent to set those prices, how can you do the trading if you become a price maker? And there's a question at the back. Uh, yes, following on from the question about um, uh, transaction costs. Um, uh, it also feels to me very important to be thinking about um, that horrible phrase, customer acquisition costs, because if you uh, look at the current value stack, that's pretty much the only area um, that you can really do anything about if you assume that we are still going to all have to be paying um, um, an amount to keep the uh, network up and running. Okay, thank you. So we've got three questions there, one on transactions, who and costs, one on black blockchain, about how and operating blockchain, and the third one on that wonderful phrase, as you said, Barbara, customer acquisition costs. Now, who would like to start? Would you want to start at one end or, or the other end? Would you like to start? Who? It's like start at this end. <laughs> it's like I've picked the short straw. Ah. Um, I think it's very difficult um, as a, well, potentially my, my hat here would be a, a technology vendor. It's very difficult to approach that question impartially. Obviously, we would like to be the next sort of Facebook of, of energy uh, in a good way. Um, and, you know, be the, the kind of the benevolent um, technology platform that happens to, you know, usher in this um, decentralised energy revolution through enabling peer-to-peer -peer and providing the technology platform and taking a, you know, a tiny, tiny slice off for each transaction and making billions that way. But it's really a matter for, for the, the, the regulator to decide uh, if they do change the regulation, what um, monopolies might be created and how they, um, you know, ensure that um, those are, um, you know, that those are, are fair and done in done in the right way, and it's a very complex and gnarly issue um, to, to to do correctly, and that's probably part of the reason why, um, you know, the regulation hasn't been changed yet. Um, so that that's my perspective on on that one. Right. Um, if if I can just say something on um, the customer acquisition thing, um, I think. Our, our hope, if maybe not our expectation, is that because we are dealing with a distinct geographical area and a small geographical area, um, that we will uh, and will be sort of balancing locally, then we will be able to offset some of those um, use of system charges, um, particularly, say, for the transmission network. Um, Having act, although of course you've got to acknowledge that ultimately we do rely on that for for a backup, and so there is some need 
to contribute to its um, to its maintenance. So, I mean, we, we we hope that there will be an opportunity to unpick some of those charges, but. Um, Again, it's not within our gift really to control that. Um, uh, but for the individual businesses within this, they will at least get the benefit of the behind the meter um, use of generation that they, that, they, that they have. I don't currently have anything to add. Mike, um, I'll, I'll add a few thoughts, and I'm sure Alexandra can, and I guess David might want to come in on this as well. Um, I mean, the points on transaction costs, I mean, I think the points that people often make in relation to distributed ledgers is the, the disintermation, disintermediation element, um, mm -hmm. the fact that you don't have some uh, intermediate party who is having to uh, handle the cost of vast transactions. They're all done directly on the blockchain via, in an automated way, through the use of smart contracts. Um, I know that, I mean, I've heard directly of projects in this space, for example, to do with vehicle, um, electric vehicle charging based on blockchain, which have run into the ground and not worked because the actual transaction costs of running on the Ethereum blockchain have, have mm -hmm. been high, something like a dollar a transaction or something like that, okay. which clearly uh, just is un completely untenable. And if you're having multiple million <laughs> transactions, uh, isn't going isn't to happen. Um, so there are some questions there. Um, I guess I would say on the question of, I, I think it was like, how, how does this actually operate as a, as a market on the blockchain or getting into that question? Um, without being a technical specialist, uh, you know, all I would say I think is that you don't, you don't necessarily anticipate the entire process um, to be run on the blockchain. There could be auction elements where prices are set, which aren't necessarily happening on that blockchain infrastructure, but which smart con but that is on the blockchain infrastructure, smart contracts are executing in response to prices which emerge from these auction mechanisms, which are operating somewhat independently. But uh, yeah, others might want to come in on this. Sorry. We did not use the whole purpose then. Will we still have a central entity then? No, because it deals with everything. Real time. Yeah. Potentially. <laughs> Yeah, I think that. Sorry, Alexander. And I think that uh, when it comes to energy, you'll probably have um, permission blockchains. So, <coughs> sorry, um, you know, like public blockchain is Bitcoin, for example, that anyone can join, and you, anyone can see the transactions that are going on online. Uh, but a permission one would be closed off. So you would have a central entity that would decide who joins it and what are the, let's say, rules of conduct. But it would still remain in blockchain and how the information would be immutable and would remain on the blockchain for everyone to see and everyone would check it and make sure no fraud is taking place. So these would be smaller blockchains. But yeah, as you say, it defeats a bit the point of blockchain, you know, because there would be kind of like control there. So, but with energy, I think you don't really have a choice because it's such a fragile space. One, it's just for the clarification on that. It's worth, if, if you haven't come across the Energy Web Foundation, they're kind of coming up or have come up with a, a blockchain for energy entities in this space to use for these processes, which, you know, the whole aim of that is to have much lower transaction costs, and, um, but it's permissioned and subject to these same limitations uh, that Alexandra mentioned, you know. David, Mike had suggested you wanted you might want to come in on any of these. Um, I mean, I think Mike captured the point with respect to transaction costs. There's a big gap between the theory and the practice. So, in currently publicly available blockchain platforms like Ethereum, transaction costs far exceed what the what we would ultimately like to see, which is driving down these to near zero. So, if we're actually trading kilowatt hours of energy, we have to have those zero transaction costs, otherwise it just kills the trading platform. And the, there's a, it's a very rapidly evolving space, so you've seen some big players come in, like um, Block One and others, which are basically saying we will not have any transaction costs on the network, and they will make this separately. So, so there are models, whether they survive the transition to economically viable ones is another question. There's a bit of a wait and see on that one. Um, the, the question with respect to how trading functions on blockchain is actually 
uh, probably one for coffee or maybe even a beer. It's quite a complicated. Okay, thank you. Are there other other questions from the audience? Trent. So I'm curious. Uh, it's kind of more general, but across the panel, we talk peer to peer and we're in community energy, but there's no question we're becoming more decentralized, but how decentralized? And is it really true, do you have any research that individual consumers have a strong desire to be prosumers, and what percentage of the population? And are the uh, applications that you talked about, like really like peer-to-peer -peer among community energy systems and aggregators and that kind of thing, what, what's the discussion um, at that level? And there was a question down here, which uh, add into that one. follows on from that, really. It's, it's um, what blockchain uh, and these kinds of systems, and by the way, blockchain is not the only technology that's possible directed. Basic the graphs could be a better way. We don't know about that yet. But um, uh, the speed at which transactions will have to take place to realize the value from, from this technology is potentially a, there probably would lend itself to the machine to machine environment to make decisions yeah. on how to optimize the local balancing situation, which already suggests you're going to reverse the hierarchy of balancing from the edge towards the interior of the network anyway, which is contrary to what we have already. But what I what I want to get at in all of this technology is where does the community consultation come in to uh, associate the social values that are desired for a local energy system by the local people in influencing how all this is set up. Okay. Well, those two seem to relate quite closely to each other. Well, there's any other questions there that... Well, perhaps... Ah, I'm yeah, a, Tim? I'm rolling out with the fog related. Sorry, Tim from, uh, from Tindall, Manchester. I was wondering about the kind of, the kind of scale of these local energy trading systems has clearly been an issue in, in France and Spain to kind of get the, the, uh, this big geographical scope and it struck me that the, the business park which I'm in Sussex is a fairly, as business park, so it's a pretty massive one. Yeah. Um, a, lot, a lot of players in there, but I wonder what kind of, you know, we get asked in the community energy research, what scale of community do you mean for a local energy system and uh, what's commercially viable but also kind of politically as an entity where people who feel they want to talk to each other. Any thoughts on, on that? Okay, so who would like to start us off this time? <laughs> I can start with um, some information about how the business park at Manor Royal and the businesses there are working collaboratively. It's hard, and you can see the value of working together but it's quite still intangible and each business has their own, currently has their own return on investments that they need if they're going to invest in these sorts of things. So we've also been exploring the options of third party financing and bringing in third party finance. But as to the scale, my understand, our understanding currently is that to bring in third party financing you need to have quite a lot of the businesses wanting to the wanting to the equivalent of wanting to rent their roof space out to make it pos to make it feasible for your pension funds or your, for your other people like that to want to invest in that kind of space so scale is really difficult and if people want to install on their own and then get the most benefits, then you need to aggregate up for both selling the power that you're generating and you could also then purchase power collectively across the business district. And the businesses are still figuring it out if they want to do that and how they can do that. And we don't yet know what the minimum number of businesses is or the minimum number of, or the minimum amount of power for each of those options is yet. It's a work in progress, but it is something that we are exploring further. Does that answer those, those questions? No. Partly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the only thing to say is uh, I'd like to add is that uh, we are, of course, engaged with our DNO there, who's UKPN, mm. um, and so it's an interesting conversation about um, 
you know, about what collective we can bring to them to add and how we will participate in their flexibility services and all that sort of stuff, um, assuming we, we get to a stage where we've got PV and storage and all the rest of it. Um, it's, yeah, so the scale thing, we're starting small, I think, is, is the real answer because it's going to be voluntary um, and, and it's going to have to grow um, more or less organically as people see the benefits that the early adopters are getting. So uh, um, the scale and then how big can you go? We'll see. If I could just have a go at the um, scale question from a sort of technology perspective. Um, our solution is actually machine to machine. It's fully automated. Um, I believe personally that blockchain might be a, a red herring in peer-to-peer -peer for, for various reasons. I know researchers are looking at it. We had an excellent uh, presentation on it. Um, but, you know, other startups within the industry would violently disagree with that. Um, but the reason why, certainly at domestic level, domestic consumer, I, think, I believe it needs to be fully automated. Um, I worked on a lot of um, smart metering projects back in the day, looking at how you could uh, engage with the consumer through smart meters and, and particularly in-home displays. Um, and there's this sort of honeymoon period where they are engaged, and these are the, the active uh, people, and then that engagement drops off and the energy savings drop off. And I've sort of <laughs> come to this uh, conclusion that people generally lead short and busy lives and they're interested in the economic savings but being abstracted from actually having to get involved with it and you know having these constant demands on their attention so if you can offer something that's fully uh, automated and that gets you know their trading agent gets them the best price um, and there's low overheads um, uh, then then they'll be all ears but if they have to you know, get involved all the time and make um, complex decisions that, you know, that they don't have the knowledge to, to be fully informed about, um, then I think, you know, that, then it's, it, it, it's not going to work. Um, as you go up to a bigger scale, the more kind of municipal scale systems, then you do perhaps have an, a dedicated person within those organisations who, who is informed and can make those decisions. But even so, those decisions are generally made on longer timescales. You know, uh, supply contracts are uh, a, a, a subtle dance of you know, careful negotiations and, and are so painful that, that are often tied in over a, a long timescale. But here we're talking about you know, ad hoc opportunistic trading between multiple entities and, and really you want to be able to automate that kind of complexity. Would anyone else like to come in on any of those? Points? I'd just like to react to the community um, consultation question. So, I think you have a point that community energy is not directly being asked, what do you think about this? Um, and also with the off-chain sandbox, it starts with an advisory stage where um, entities can approach off-chain and say, this rule is a problem for me, and then they decide if they go into sandbox. But as I said, it's only open to um, licensed uh, entities uh, or partners. And in, in the pilots that are going on in the sandbox in the UK, you have community energy groups that are participating. And I think that they're actually essential here because it, it provides the ideal setting to, to test peer-to-peer -peer energy trading uh, within a confined space. And um, yeah, as I said, these, the, the laws in Spain and France, they also recognize that, that these entities are very important also to protect the people uh, that are trading between each other. And from speaking to community energy stakeholders uh, at European level, uh, such as the Association of Community Energy in Brussels and uh, also in Spain. Um, I, I think that there is very much an interest in peer-to-peer uh, in -peer energy trading within community energy. Mike, do you want to have a last word? Um, yep, yeah, I will just briefly say so. I mean, we've been doing some work recently looking at, uh, you know, what sort of demand there might be to actually participate in peer-to-peer -peer trading in this, in this sense, as a consumer, like, would you want to participate as a consumer? Because it can be a bit of a hypothetical leap to say, if you had solar panels, would you participate? And um, that, so that's based on survey work at the moment. Um, indicates, you know, with the usual caveats around people's stated intentions in a survey, pretty high levels, you know, more than half of people saying they would um, participate in um, this sort of scheme. Um, higher levels, 
uh, when it's, you know, to get to the scale question, when it's pitched as being kind of at a city region level, lower levels, uh, if, it's, if it's a sort of a national scale scheme or even a, a very hyper local sort of streets around a neighborhood level scheme, which is, which is interesting. Um, we should be making a preprint of that work available, I should imagine, within the next one to two months, um, probably on the open science framework uh, stuff, which I talked about if you're interested. And just a second quick reflection on the machine to machine point. I mean, previous work I've done looking at perceptions of control in the context of automation. Um, you know, you, certainly automating something doesn't remove people from the picture or, or diminish necessarily a sense of agency. In fact, I think it can increase it. So long as people have got a, a, a sort of a supervisory oversight, setting in a simple way the right defaults, it can, you know, with the opportunities to override and get and dig in and become more involved if that's what people want. Um, so I don't think those two things are mutually incompatible. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Very interesting discussion, a very varied set of papers there. Hope we'll be able to follow up further on those points. Thank you. Everybody, just a quick reminder, we have got a very brief closing session in about five minutes. We just need to give other people a chance to join us. I won't, we won't detain you very long, though.
Okay, thank you very much for coming back. Could I just have everyone's attention for the last few minutes? Thank you. So you are all so, uh, privileged that you've st stuck around so you can hear uh, the dramatic things I'm going to now announce. I mean, not really, but, uh, but thank you for, for sticking around uh, uh, for, for the end of the second day. I've, I've only got a few things to say just to close the conference. Um, Keith delegated it to me because he's got to go much further than I have uh, today to get home, so uh, he had to go and get a, a train. Um, I, I don't know about you, but and hopefully the, the, the reflections I have reflect some of the conversations I've had, which is that many people have really enjoyed the conference. The, um, I think the particular thing people keep saying is they've really liked the combination of academics and practitioners, the local authorities, the community groups and others, uh, and that we brought those together. That was our intention and I'm glad it's worked, so hopefully um, it's worked for most of you. Um, and lots of um, uh, potential for collaboration and so on. I've, asked, I've been asked to remind you that there is a, a, an email gone to everybody asking for feedback. There's a, a very short, I hope, survey. Um, so if you do have suggestions, about how we might improve things, as well as uh, things you liked, but also, um, you know, conference topics for the future. This is something we will continue to do on an annual basis. It's one of the things UKIRK does on behalf of the wider research and other communities to bring you together, so it's not just about our own research. So if you've got ideas for topics, formats, etc., for future years, that would be uh, really, really useful. There's already some follow-up on the website, so Tom Hayes' speech from yesterday is already on our website, uh, the, the transcript of that. I think the live stream will still be live. I think there's going to be a video put together and potentially further blogs and things to follow. So um, some follow-up uh, from that. Um, a few reflections on areas I thought or things that, that struck me. I mean, it's been very rich and I certainly can't summarize it all, but um, just a few things that, that struck me as, as themes. I think one was, and it came out in questions today, that this distinction between local energy, local authorities, and community energy seems to be really breaking down now, uh, and there is a lot more sort of collaboration across those categories. I remember the time when community energy first emerged, and it was being set up almost in opposition to anything that was more, in quotes, official. And I'm seeing, certainly in the presentations, a lot more um, examples of collaboration and so on, and that local energy seemed to be the right title. I don't know if I've captured that uh, for everybody. We've heard a huge amount about technical trials, demonstrations and projects, some of which are quite big, such as the ones we heard about in Oxford, but also the role of technology in enabling markets and in understanding um, energy demand in more detail. You know, uh, Phil's, uh, Phil Grunewald's research is a good example of that, using technology to really understand what's going on and identifying opportunities. But I think the other thing that struck me is that people were talking about technology often related to all the other dimensions of local energy, whether it be the economics, the business model, uh, social dimensions and social change, and of course governance, uh, which is another point that came out to me. I think a, a third point is about salience. It's a question that's often asked about uh, at conferences like this. You know, is, uh, there's all this activity at the local level, but what does it really add up to in terms of the grand scheme of meeting UK climate change targets? I think uh, somebody asked that direct question yesterday. But I think some of the answers, either implicitly or explicitly, have been about the engagement and the, uh, uh, the feeling of belonging on being part of the transition as much as adding up the megawatts and kilowatt hours and so on of energy savings or of generation. I mean, of course, that's important and that seems to have grown over the last few years and will grow further, but I think it's the engagement and the legitimacy of action at a local level which is also important. And that leads me on to my fourth reflection. There's been a really strong uh, theme of justice and engagement through the whole uh, couple of days. I was really struck and I was really pleased we had some diversity in the local authorities that we, uh, we had here. So we did have Oxford and we had Bristol, you know, fairly uh, relatively well off or at least some well off populations. So they're the ones that, you know, perhaps have the resources, the social capital in their areas to do more. Lots of the bigger projects, which are great to see. But actually, it was really nice to hear from Oldham, just to give another example about some of their... The, you know, some of the uh, hard work they had to go through to get some of the things off the ground in community energy there. Um, but actually, they made it work too, but they just had to do it in a different way. Uh, and as, as Andy just reminded me, it was linking energy to other agendas. So starting with the other agendas as a way of bringing uh, local energy into the picture. 
Um, citizen engagement has come out very strongly. I think I was very struck by what Tom Hayes said yesterday about the needing of needing that in order to gain consent for ambitious local action and targets and so on, um, rather than doing the easy thing perhaps as a politician, which is to announce a net zero target yesterday and then risk not being able to meet it and not having the consent of the citizens in the local area to actually deliver what's needed to get there. Um, so I thought his answer to that particular question was quite uh, good. I think the thing we haven't talked about that much, although it was asked about in questions, is uh, you know, at a local level you often have thorny questions about what you stop doing and what you don't invest in. And I think in a local area that, that's often more difficult because you have direct jobs and things in there. So that whole just transition conversation, which certainly Scottish Government has picked up, I think there's more to be done there at the local level and the national level to think about how do you transition, not in terms of things that we're only in terms of things you need to start, but actually how do you get out of things which are not compatible with the pathway to a net zero economy. And I think my final theme, which came out really well in one of the workshops this morning, I was torn, so both the workshops look fascinating. I chose the one on, on governance uh, myself. We had a really good discussion about national governance, the link to local governance, how things might need to change, but there's clearly a lot of questions about governance come up uh, and a lot of thinking still to do and a lot of reform to do if we're really going to um, get to net zero, but also to have a, a strong local dimension to the net zero uh, transition. But the other point, which I think uh, perhaps we haven't had as much about, although I guess local authorities is part of the picture, is just what do we need to do with local governments, local institutions? Is it building on local authorities as legitimate institutions? Do we need new institutions? How does Ofgem as a regulator deal with uh, you know, regional differences across England and so on and so forth? Um, so there's, there's a whole agenda there. So those are just some of my personal reflections. I'm sure you'll have many of your own, but um, hopefully that's, uh, you know, the two days have made you all, all think and, 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 and uh, develop new uh, agendas and so on. I just wanted to repeat the thanks that uh, Keith and I uh, made yesterday um, to the steering group. I think you've all done an excellent job in shaping the program, choosing the papers, chairing the discussions. Um, particularly Keith, uh, in his absence, I think he did a, a brilliant job on chairing it. Newkirk team, thank you again very, very much for all the hard work behind the scenes in, in developing uh, the programme, making the conference happen and, and dealing with all the, uh, the inevitable things that, at the last minute that we have to do. And thank you to all of you for coming and participating. And I should also acknowledge, because I think we were naughty and didn't do it yesterday, our funders, uh, the re uh, UKRI, the research councils who fund UKIRK. Um, without them, of course, we, none of this would be possible. So I wanted to make a point of thanking them. Finally, uh, just a few things that's coming up. So um, UKIRK, uh, as I said yesterday, is 15 years old, and uh, you know we have a, another a few years ahead of us of, of work to do. Um, our next event is on the 23rd of May, um, which is to talk about some work we've been doing in the, uh, the last couple of years on disruption and continuity in energy systems. We're going to be launching a report with a panel discussion in London um, at a late afternoon event on the 23rd of May. We will be publishing and publicizing more details of our future research program, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, but at the moment um, there's a certain amount that we, we can't say about what our plans are, but watch this space on our website about our, our themes, our future priorities in terms of our research. But crucially also, for those of you not involved directly, there'll be details coming about how to get involved in UCO, both in terms of opportunities to bid into our research fund um, in the future, opportunities to bid for small grants to do networking projects and so on. So there's a whole set of things we would be doing to bring in other people in the community. Uh, and so just watch the website for details of that, those things in the coming month. So I think that's all I have to say, apart from saying thank you and have a safe journey home. <laughs>